so far we've stuck with the linear versions of support vector machines, and now it's time to take that next step. So fundamentally, these SVMs are actually linear methods, but as we've talked about with other linear regression methods, we can actually turn them into nonlinear uh, methods by doing a little bit of nonlinear preprocessing of the input features before taking the step into the linear method. What this gives us is the ability to, to express nonlinearities while also keeping all of the nice features of our linear tools. And the fact, what this gives us then in the context of doing classification is, is that we can express uh, curved decision boundaries in our original feature space. These nonlinear transformations can be quite powerful. We can take a very small set of features and expand those out to a very large number of uh, features. This gives us a, a, a lot of capabilities as far as building very expressive decision boundaries. Uh, but what's cool about support vector machines is that we can also do these computations very efficiently if we do things right. So let's talk some about the transformation process and then a little bit more about the mathematics of actually uh, using these nonlinear transforms in the support vector machine world. So our original decision boundaries had uh, this the following form. So these are the decision boundaries that we've been talking about either in the support vector machine world or we, we talked about in the context of doing uh, linear decision boundaries a, a couple of weeks ago. And now what we'd like to be able to do is take this, this X vector and impose a transformation on that. So it's a, a vector of some features. We'll call that uh, that transformation V. And and we write the the resulting vector just as uh, like this with a, a phi sub x. And the the new model that we end up with, and and you've seen this already before, uh, is one where we have w transpose not x but now phi of x plus b is equal to uh, zero. Of course, this w here that we've that we've drawn is different than this W here. The dimensionalities uh, have to match the dimensionality of what's on the, the right-hand side of that transpose. So we, we did talk about uh, polynomial kernels before, but we'll do a quick review. The book also gives you a nice example uh, with polynomial kernels. So imagine I have a scenario where my X is a vector of three elements, x0, x1, x2. And what the polynomial kernel of degree uh, two does is that it transforms uh, this into a, a new vector, which is all possible combinations, products of pairs of elements within this vector. So uh, the first one is, is x0 squared, so x0 multiplied by itself, and likewise for x1 and x2. But we also get the cross product, so we get x, x0, x1, and x1, x2. Now it's going to be convenient for those to actually have a constant multiplied by them, so I'm gonna go ahead and write those in. The book has these as well, and you'll see uh, why uh, those are useful. The, the root two works for, for degree two and you'll need other uh, constants for other degrees. Um, so what we've done here is we've gone from a three-dimensional input space to now a five-dimensional uh, input space. Let's do one other example where now X is actually four-dimensional, X zero, x1, x2, and a constant one down at the bottom. What phi does for us, again, is all possible combinations of those. And, and so those are x0 squared, x1 squared, x2 squared, and then the two that we've 
that we added down at the bottom before, x1, x2. But it also, but we also have all of the components that are multiplied by that one down in the, the last uh, element there. So we have x0, x1, x2, and one can be multiplied with itself. So here we've gone from four-dimensional space to a nine-dimensional one. And, and actually what's cool about this transformation is that we not only have these quadratic uh, features, but we also have the linear features and the, the constant feature. And, and that gives us a lot of uh, expressibility. So the key here is typically this phi transformation takes us from some small dimensional vector to a very uh, large one. For a lot of different scenarios, this is not really a problem. But let's imagine our scenario like our BMI uh, situation. So, so in that case, uh, x is it's about a thousand dimensions. And for uh, d, d of 2, then uh, phi of x becomes really a, a thousand uh, squared over two plus one thousand uh, dimensions and and this gets to be a pretty large uh, number and we'd rather not have to compute that uh, explicitly and with our modern machines this is uh, easy to do even on a desktop or a laptop machine uh, but it's hard for us to imagine going much beyond this so if I go to say 10,000 features in X, then we're really blowing out what we can do in a, a smaller machine. Or if D gets bigger than two, th then it also uh, really blows out what a, a small machine can do. And so this takes us into what the literature and the book talk about is the dual problem. And what it allows us to do is we're, we're going to transform our optimization problem from one uh, where we have these variables W and Bs and, and possibly the Zetas as well to, to one where uh, the new variables are, we're gonna call all of those alphas. And there's one for every uh, training set element. So, so these are, we're, we're going to change the, the problem up so, so we don't need W and B anymore, but we just need the alphas. And I'm going to go ahead and write out uh, what the problem is. Its derivation is really beyond the scope of this, uh, of this class. It involves uh, making use of Lagrangian multipliers. Um, the derivations are out there, though, and I encourage those of you who, uh, who are more into the mathematics to, to take a look at those. Um, but let me, let me go ahead and write this out. Um, we're going to compute the minimum of some objective function over all of our alphas. And the objective function looks like this. So it's a double sum over our training set in each of the two uh, sums. And it's alpha i, alpha j, y i, y, j and then our feature our feature sets and right now we're we're sticking within uh we're, we're assuming that we don't have a fee here and then there's one other term which says that that the sum of all of the alphas subtracts off the sum of all of the alphas and this is uh subject to For every one of the alphas, we want that alpha j to be greater than or equal to zero. Now, I, I realize that this looks like it comes uh, completely out of the blue, and uh, in some sense that it does, and the, the book just throws it at you as well. I, again, if you want to go through that derivation process, you can. L let me work in a little bit of intuition, uh, however. Um, first off, um, these are our original feature vectors, x, xi, xj. We're ignoring phi for the moment, but we'll get back around to that. And wi and wj are the true labels of our 
for our training set elements. And these are either uh, positive or negative one corresponding to positive and negative examples. So once, once we have the problem formulated in, in this way, we can transform that into the standard quadratic programming formulation and compute a solution for all of the, uh, for all of the alphas. And, and I'm gonna leave it at that. Uh, but once we have those alphas, what's the relationship between these alphas and the original variables that we, uh, that, that we actually care about? And the, the answer is that our Ws can be expressed in terms of a sum over all of our training set elements, which are alpha j, y j, x, uh, x j. So it's a weighted sum of all of the feature vectors and uh, y is either positive or negative one, and alpha is non-negative. It's either uh, zero or, or positive. The B, uh, there is also a, a, a relationship here. Um, I'm just going to write it out and not worry too much about the intuition for this one. It relies on already having computed w hat here. So, so, so that's the transformation to get us back from the, the dual world with our alphas back into uh, w and b. And that's really a b hat there since that's an estimate. So let me, let me make one observation here. So, so remember that uh, with the original formulation of the support vector machine, we were trying to optimize W transpose W. So, so let's take uh, this W here and substitute that in. And so what we end up with is N minus one, so our alpha, uh, alpha J, uh, Y J, X J. So that's going to give us a, a vector. Take the transpose of that and another sum here. And I'm gonna use a different index variable. And that's going to allow us to, to do an, the next step. Xi. Okay, so, so both of these here came from this solution over here. Now if you work through this, this product here, this vector product, we can uh, multiply this through, and what you end up with is something that looks like this. So it's a double sum, and, and I'm keeping the, the J's and the I's the same here. And it is uh, alpha i, sorry, let's, yeah, alpha i, alpha j, uh, y i, y j, and then it's x, it's x, technically x j transpose x i. And since this itself is a scalar, we can actually reverse those two, and that'll be convenient to do that. So uh, x, j, and x, i there. The, the key uh, observation here is that this uh, double sum here is exactly the sum that we had up here. So let's bring that up. Uh, aside from we, the, the, the half we didn't uh, take into account. Um, so. So this, so, so the message here is that the cost function that we created in our dual space turns out to, at least this left-hand side part, is equal to uh, what we would use for our, uh, the, the cost function in our original support vector machine uh, representation, except now we've substituted in an equation for our Ws that includes our x's and y's and our alphas. So by, by using at least this piece of the uh, cost function, that means that a solution in our dual space is going to give us the same type of solution in the original space. 
The other piece of our cost function here, this is uh, about uh, adhering to certain kinds of uh, constraints. And as it turns out that adding this piece to uh, the dual cost function doesn't actually change the solution that we end up uh, finding. Uh, so so the, the big message here is that solving this giant cost function in the original, in the dual space will actually give us a, uh, we'll, we'll also optimize the cost function in the original space. And, and to see that more precisely, you really have to go back into the uh, derivation. All right, let's talk about the decision function that we have in our, the, our dual framework here. So just a, just a reminder, we have uh, y hat for some sample is equal to W transpose X for some input plus B. And our decision function itself is uh, Y hat equals uh, zero. Uh, but if it's positive, then we fall on one side of the line. If it's negative, we're on the other side of the line. So, so now let's substitute in our uh, dual formulation for what W is. So, let's, so I'm going to do that. So this is uh, sum over all of our training samples. And that's alpha, alpha j, y j, x j. And that quantity uh, transpose. And that's going to be multiplied by whatever our new set of features is. And of course, we have our plus b there. We can push this this query feature set into the summation. And, and that gives us uh, this function here. So remember that uh, this will just be a, uh, a scalar once we multiply those two vectors together. And, and so what we end up with is a weighted sum of the scalars where the weights are the true value of the corresponding training element and, and then the alpha j that we've computed uh, as part of the optimization process. All right, with this formulation now, we're ready to start talking about our nonlinear expansion. So, so now we've already uh, set all of this up. So that's where we're taking some, some uh, x input here uh, and transforming it through phi to give us our, our phi of x, which presumably is much uh, larger uh, in dimensionality than our original x. So, so our new decision function becomes I, I should emphasize that uh, we're assuming that we're uh, now introducing these nonlinear uh, features into the process, and, and that means that we actually have to do uh, another round of learning. It's not that we can we could learn our alphas uh, in the context of a linear situation and, and then bring them right over to the nonlinear situation. So, so now it, our y hat becomes a becomes this function here. And, and when we do that same substitution, and again, this, this W here is different than this W sitting up here. When we do the substitution for what W looks like, then we end up with uh, this. So again, a summation over all the training set elements, alpha J, Y J, and we have uh, phi of X J, transpose and then phi of some other x query and then of course that's plus b so when this nonlinear transformation is big in dimensionality that means this inner product right here is uh, is also big so if i have uh, k dimensions then that means that i have uh, k products plus uh, k minus one sums uh, in order in order to evaluate just this piece here. And then I have to do this over 
either the entire training set or just the training set uh, elements where I have uh, support vectors. But the, the key is that it turns out we can make this evaluation super efficient in the right conditions. And, and so uh, the, the book does part of this and let's, let's work through it here as well. Um, so let's imagine the polynomial case where x1 is x110, x11, x12, and x2 is equal to x20, x21, x22. And, and let's assume that our polynomial expansion is of dimension degree two. So what that means is that phi of x1 becomes x1 zero squared, x1 one squared, x1 two squared, and then the cross terms. One, two, okay. And, and likewise, uh, the same for, uh, for x2. So if I now have uh, an inner product of these two, x1 and phi of x2, then that gives us this inner product here. Two x uh, two zero x two one square root of two x two one x two two. If I take that that inner product, that uh, that is just the product of these two terms added to the product of these two terms, etc. And that gives us x one zero squared x two zero squared. And, and on down the line, x11 squared, x21 squared, x12 uh, squared, x22 squared, and then uh, 2 x10, x11, x20, x21, and I've run out of space, so there's one more term, x11, x12, x21, x22. And if you, you work through the algebra of this, then this turns out to be equal to the following. And that, that's some quantity squared. So this times this gives us this term Likewise for this term and this term, and then these are the, cr the cross terms. So this term here is multiplied by this term on uh, two different uh, occasions, and, and likewise for the remaining two terms here. Okay, so, um, so that's interesting. And furthermore, this is equal to uh, the following, x10, x11, x21 multiplied by x20, x21, x22. And I messed up my, my uh, indices here. So this is actually x12. Okay, so it's it's relatively quick to uh, verify that this inner product is exactly this internal sum here, and then if I take this to the second power, then then we have this equivalency between the the two expressions. This turns out to be uh, true generally. So specifically, so this is a general case. We have uh, degree D, 
and uh, a constant one. Then, and, and so this is our phi transformation. By constant one, I mean that we're atta attacking on the one at the end. I didn't do that in the above example, but I did that uh, a couple of examples back. Then what, what this means is that the transformation of x1 transpose uh, trans, uh, multiplied by the expansion of x2, this is equal to the inner product of just x1 and x2 plus 1 raised to the dth power. So the big win here is that this is potentially a lot of computation. There are a lot of features there, but here we have a relatively small number of features. So, so the overall computation here is quite inexpensive. So let's come back around to this observation here. Paste in what we started with. And, and now what we can do is uh, substitute what we just derived uh, in for this term here. So that's equal to, again, still sum over the training set. In the case of the polynomial kernel, this just becomes xj transpose x, whatever the query is, plus 1 raised to the dth power. And we also need a plus b in here. This whole piece right here can be written in terms of what we call a kernel function. And the notation for this is k xj comma star. So what we end up with then is this, alpha j yj and then k xj comma x star plus b. So there are, there's a whole variety of different transformations out there, all of which have a corresponding kernel function that is very cheap to compute. Um, one of which uh, looks like this. So the Gaussian uh, kernel uh, looks like this, k of x1, x2, It looks like this. Where gamma is a, a hyperparameter. And it turns out we can just go and use this uh, kernel function. As long as it's, these kernel functions satisfy certain criteria, we can actually turn around and use them. For the case of the Gaussian kernel function, the corresponding phi actually gives us a vector that's uh, of infinite dimensions. There are an infinite number of components there. So, so the cool thing here is that uh, we are building decision surfaces in, a, in an infinite dimensional space and, and yet being able to uh, perform the computations very inexpensively. So to sum up then, uh, we don't actually have to articulate what the, the fees are. We can, we can use the kernel functions and the, the book talks a little bit about what the requirements are for a kernel function. Uh, and, and furthermore, if we already have two proper kernel functions, in this case k1 and k2, then we can actually combine them in a variety of ways in order to uh, create new kernel functions. For example, we can take the sum of the two kernel functions and that gives us a new valid kernel function. We can also take the product of those. In fact, any linear transformation uh, of a kernel function is valid uh, and in any uh, product as well. So what we get out of this is that we can express decision surfaces in very high dimensional spaces without explicitly working in that space. So, so what that means is we don't have to compute the feature vectors, the expanded feature vectors, and we don't have to uh, actually explicitly represent the corresponding weight functions. For a single query with support vector machines, we still have to touch all of the training set samples that are support vectors. Uh, for, for the non-support vectors, our, uh, our alphas are actually zero, so we can just drop them out of the sum, so that saves us a little bit, uh, but it can still be a very large set 
of non-zero alphas. And this becomes a really big issue as the training sets get very large, especially when we're talking about uh, the training process where we actually have to consider uh, all possibilities of whether samples are going to be uh, in the support vector set or, or not. So, so support vector machines give us some great power as far as what they can represent, but, uh, but there are limitations even on some of our bigger machines as to how big the, uh, the training set can actually be. 